Good morning again, here we are, another morning, Sunday the 18th of August, fast pushing on to the end of the month too, so welcome again as we continue our studies, Heavenly Helps in Hebrews, and we trust that the Lord will bless this morning again as we come in now to chapter 3 of this great book. It is interesting to see that when we come to chapter 3, we find the Holy Spirit speaking. When you come to chapter 1, you remember, in chapter 1, God the Father speaks. Remember how our book starts? God, who at sundry times and endeavours manners speak. So you have God speaking in chapter 1. When you come to chapter 2, the Lord Jesus is speaking. Verse 11 of chapter 2, Both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. So the Lord Jesus speaks in chapter 2. Now when we come to chapter 3 and look, glance down at verse 7. Wherefore as the Holy Spirit saith today, if you will hear his voice. So we have the Trinity speaking in the first three chapters. God the Father speaks in chapter 1. God the Son speaks in chapter 2. And God the Holy Spirit speaks in chapter 3. So we're at chapter 3 this morning. We're going to consider... The Lord Jesus again, because he is the great theme and subject of the book, The Man Christ Jesus. So we're going to read the first few verses of the chapter. We'll not read it all now, and we'll refer to most of it this morning. But uh, I trust that maybe uh, you who have your Bibles have read it. But if you haven't, follow on, and we'll read the first six verses down, and that'll give us a start this morning. Hebrews chapter 3, and verse number 1. Wherefore? The writer says, Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house has more honour than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. From verse 7 down to the end we have the second great warning section of the book. You remember the first warning was in chapter uh, two of the book, How Shall We Escape If We Neglect? So it was neglecting the great salvation in chapter 2. We'll find when we come to these verses in chapter 3, it's unbelief. It was because of unbelief that the nation didn't enter into the things that God has prepared for them. So he deals with unbelief in the second part of the chapter. So the Lord give us good understanding as we move into these verses this morning, just gone 25 past 8, nice morning, lovely and sunny and bright, and uh, we'll see how we get on as the Lord helps this morning. So, when we come to chapter 3 then, the writer begins a long section, uh, which actually takes us through to chapter 8, and he now becomes deeply involved and interested in Old Testament typology. He's going to prove that that Old Testament era was merely one of sh shadows, and he's going to show us that the substance is in the person of Christ and his cross. Someone has said that the new is in the old contained and the old is by the new explained. And that's true. And we'll see that this morning as we go in. The new is in the old contained. The old is by the new explained. So he's going to go back into Old Testament characters and Old Testament doctrines. He's going to mention Moses. He's going to mention We'll see that this morning. He's going to mention Aaron and Joshua. We'll see that next week all being well. He's going to mention Melchizedek. And what a morning we'll have when we come to this character. Because it says about him in verse in chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days or end of life. So here's this great character. No father, no mother. No beginning of days, no end of life. What does it mean? Well, we'll have to deal with that and look at him when we come to it by and by. And then he looks at the sacrifices and the sanctuary and the covenants and all those things. 
And he's going to show us that the substance of these things is found in our New Testament in the person of Christ and his great cross work. You see, Moses and Aaron and Joshua were three great princes of the Jewish nation. When he would start to talk about these men, the years of these Jewish believers would prick up because uh, Moses was a great man of God. He was the man who brought the people out, of course. And um, Joshua was the man who brought them in, of course. And then Aaron was the man who represented God to the people. So in these chapters 3 and into chapters 4, he's going to show us the preeminence of Christ. And then when you come to chapter 4, he's going to take up the great subject of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus. Now you see, we must remember that this was a big step for the Jewish believer. Here were 1,500 years of of the, of, of, of the law. And this was a big step for them because when the Saviour, the Lord Jesus, said it is finished on the cross, well, there were several things that were finished, of course. His sayings were finished. We know that. We took a few Sundays, seven Sundays, didn't we, to look at those seven sayings of the Saviour's sayings. Were all, his sufferings were all finished when he said it is finished on the cross. And who will be able to estimate, Thomas Shields said, the sufferings of Christ challenge comparison. I'm sure they do. And then the great work of salvation was finished. And that righteous basis were, was laid whereby God is able to be just and just a fire of all who believe in Jesus. But there's another thing. The scriptures were all finished. And all those religious ordinances and concepts were all finished. The, the veil was rent. And the Jew had to face the facts. And that's what he's putting before them here in a very good manner, in a good way. He's showing them that, that the Lord Jesus Christ eclipses all of, those, all of those things. Calvary spelled the end of the law abruptly after those 1,500 years of the law. Remember those seven great age periods. We live in the sixth one, the age period of innocence, the age period of conscience, of civil government, of promise, the age period of the law which takes us up to the cross. And then that great age period of grace that we live in today. And it's almost at a close. And one of these days the Lord Jesus is coming back to take his church out. And then there's a terrible time of tribulation. And then that seventh great age period. That great millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus. So this meant that the Judaistic system was gone. And gone forever. So he's going to go into chapter 3. And we are going to do that just now in a moment after a long introduction. In verses 1 to 6, he's going to show us that Christ is better than Moses. And then he'll take it up in verse 7 of chapter 3. And this is a section, it's the second great warning section of the book of Hebrews. And he's going to deal with unbelief. You see, the Old Testament for the Jew, the, ble the blessing centered in the land of Canaan. That was a land that God had prepared for them. A land flowing with milk and honey and so on. But in our New Testament, of course, the believers, their blessing centered in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the writer says, come on, let's talk about him. He says, consider, you see verse 1, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to consider him. Now notice how the verse starts. I suppose verse 1, when we look at, at all the things that are in that would really do us this morning without looking at, at any of the other verses but we'll see how we get on notice the fourfold recognition of these believers here he says you're holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling four fourfold recognition he says they're holy brethren with a small b they're called and their calling's a heavenly calling so those four things now it's interesting that he starts with holy because that is the thing that characterizes the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, isn't it? And Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, in his little epistle, Peter says, Christ has left us an example that we should follow his steps who did no sin. He was intrinsically holy. You remember at his birth? Remember the angel said to Mary in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 35, the angel said, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That holy one that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So he was holy at his birth. And then through his life will come at chapter 7 some of these days very, very soon. And we'll look down and we'll see in verse 26 
his great credentials and we'll see that the writer says such a high priest became us or meets our need who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Holy at his birth, harmless in his white life, undefiled in his death, separate from sinners in his resurrection, made higher than the heavens in his exaltation. And it's interesting that even through life uh, he was holy in everything that he did. And even the demons recognized him. Looking at that passage in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and way down at verse 34, there was a man in the synagogue that was, he had a spirit of an unclean demon, and cried out with a loud voice. Now listen to what the demon said. Let us alone, what have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, thou Holy One of God. So the demons recognized him as the Holy One of God. So that which characterized Christ ought to characterize his people, ought to characterize you and I as believers. I'm talking to believers now this morning. That characteristic ought to characterize our lives day by day. It's interesting when Paul writes in the Thessalonian epistle. And remember, the Thessalonian epistle was one of the very earliest of the epistles that were written, probably the earliest in our New Testament, uh, maybe apart from the wee book of James. But when you come to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, Paul deals with this great subject. He deals with it at length, of course. He says, Furthermore, brethren, we beseech you and exhort you how you ought to walk to please God, that what you would abound more and more. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that every one of us, of you, should know how to possess his body in sanctification and honour. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So God expects holiness in our lives. And indeed, if we're going to do anything and be anything for God, our lives will have to be clean. When Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 12 of the great book of Romans, he says this, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's the first thing? Holy. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So the thing that should characterize us and the thing that should mark our lives before God can use us at all is holiness. In fact, it comes to my mind that great verse in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, where he says, God has called us and chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So that's the very reason, says Paul, that the Lord has called us, that we should be holy in service for him. Indeed, Peter deals with it at length in his epistle too. Now, I'm laboring this a wee bit, and rightly so, because I think it's important this morning. When Peter comes to chapter 3 of his second epistle, he reminds us of the things that are going to happen. The Lord's going to come. He's not slack concerning his promise. Some men say today, where's the promise of his coming? Sure, they've talked about it for generations. Now, Peter says, hold on a wee minute. He says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. If you're not saved this morning and listening to me, that is one reason why he lingers his coming. Because he's interested in you. And he wants you to trust him as saviour. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. Those who perish in their sins, God, God led that great work, finished the Lord Jesus Finish that great work of the cross. He was forsaken that you might not be forsaken forever. So Peter says, seeing all these things are shortly, must shortly come to pass. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holiness? Be diligent that we be found in holiness and in peace without spot before him in love. So that which characterized Christ ought to characterize us. We need to be holy in our lives. If God is use, going to use us, we need to be holy on channels through which his wonderful blessings can flow. So he says you're holy. And then he says we're brethren, with a small day, of course. And you remember we looked at that last week in that lovely verse 11. Both he that sanctifieth, that is set apart. The Lord Jesus was set apart. And we who are sanctified, he has set us apart too. We're all one. 
for which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren, saying, I will declare my name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise. So we're all one. We're, we're sons of God. And you remember we saw how the Son of God became the Son of Man, that we, the sons of men, might become the sons of God. And then not only that, but he says we have a heavenly calling. It's not an earthly calling. It's a heavenly calling. You know, when Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, you can look up these verses. We haven't time this morning to look up all these verses because the time goes quickly. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it's a holy calling. Paul says to Timothy, we have been called with a holy calling. And then in Philippians 3, verse 14, it's a high calling. Paul says, I press forward for the prize of the high calling in Christ. And here it's a heavenly calling. So this calling that we have been called with is a holy calling. It's a high calling. It's a heavenly calling. We are partakers of it. You remember in chapter 2, verse 14, we are partakers of flesh and blood. Now we are partakers of the heavenly calling. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Those things that have been accomplished for us, of course, have been accomplished because of the Lord Jesus and because of his death, and we saw that last week in verse 14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. And then he embarks on these three. He is the one who has blessed us with these blessings. He is the one who was holy. He is the one, he is the one who has made us partakers of the heavenly calling. We have to consider him. And in this we have the third lovely title of the Lord Jesus brought before us. You remember title number one in chapter one? Verse 2, heir of all things. Remember the lovely title in chapter 2, verse 10, captain of our salvation. And now we come to the third lovely title in the book. Look at it, apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now the apostle, of course, is the one who is sent. He represents God to men. The high priest represents men to God. He combines these two offices. He is the apostle and he is the high priest. The apostle is the one who goes out. The high priest is the one who comes in. Now he says, this one who is the apostle and high priest of our profession, he's going to show us how he's better than Moses. He's going to take this great character, this great man who was the saviour and leader of the people. You know, 700 times Moses' name is mentioned in your Bible. Now that's interesting. and that's like, that, that just shows you the importance uh, of this man in Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, God calls him Moses, my servant. Moses, my servant. And when it comes to the end of his days, in chapter 34 of that great book of Deuteronomy that records for us his death, listen to what God says about him. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And God buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, that no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. The probably would have made a shrine to it or something like that. But God buried him. No one knows where, he, where he's buried. There's a great poem, I have it somewhere, about the old eagle flying and, and God burying Moses. And there they were alone. Tremendous poem. I'll maybe look it up sometime. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. What a man. When he was 120, he was as good a man as when he was 30 or 40. And his eye wasn't dim. He didn't need his ear either. And the children of Israel wept in the plains of Moab 30 days. Now listen to this in verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and in all the mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of Israel. What a character, what a man he was. Ah, but wait a minute. He is one who was greater than Moses. He is one who was greater than Joshua, and greater than Aaron, as we'll see next week again. And so the writer says, Con consider him. He's going to show that Moses was just a servant and a member in the household. But Christ was the son and the builder. He combines both of those ministries. He is the apostle and the high priest. So he summarizes it for us. He says, Moses, 
was a serpent, servant in God's house, but Christ was a son over God's house. You got it? Moses was a servant in God's house. Christ was a son over God's house. This man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, verse 3, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honour than the house. Now notice the faithfulness to he was faithful to him that appointed. Of course, of course, God accounts faithfulness. Faithfulness is a big thing. And it's a thing that God looks for in believers' lives. Am I faithful? Just maybe God has given me or given you some little thing to do. Are you faithful in it? The Lord Jesus Christ was faithful in everything. I was looking this morning early on at that great passage in Isaiah 42. It's the beginning of the servant section of Isaiah's prophecy. And in that servant section, we have the perfect servant. God says, behold my servant. He's the perfect servant. And in that passage, he's the perfect shepherd. He'll not cry or lift up his voice in the street. And he's the perfect saviour. The eyes of the Gentiles wait for his coming. So he was the perfect servant, the perfect shepherd, the perfect saviour. But God says this about him. He shall not fail. He was faithful and everything. Of course, God was the great master builder. Look at verse 4. Every house is built by some man, but he that has built all things is God. Now, this is interesting. Quickly, the whole body of believers in all ages constitutes the whole true house or family of God over which Christ is placed. Can I say that again? The whole body of believers in all ages constitute the whole true house or family of God over which Christ is has placed. Great verses in Ephesians chapter 2, read them for you and not misquote them, that deals with this in verse 19. Listen, Ephesians 2, 19. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly Framed together, grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom we also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. My, what wonderful verses they are. The household of God. You know, there's three lovely pictures of the church in your New Testament. First of all, it's a building that will never be demolished. It's a body that will never be dismembered. And it's a bride that will never be divorced. Now, it's a building here. He that has built all things is God. It's a building, and this building will never be demolished. You know, as you go through the country, and many of the old factories and all of those old mills that served our purpose and where hundreds of people worked in times past, and you see the large chimneys in those old buildings and those old mills through the countryside, and they're nearly extinct, and they're nearly all gone. Those buildings have all been demolished, and they're all away, but here's a building. Here's a building that will never be demolished. You know, it's built by God and it's built upon that foundation of Christ Jesus. Now, here's the question. Am I part of the household of faith? As time goes on quickly. Am I part of the household of faith? Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Are you in this household? You see, he's going to deal in the latter section. We'll take a few minutes and then finish this morning. He's going to deal with unbelief. And unbelief does two things. It keeps saints from blessing and it keeps sinners from salvation. Now it keeps saints from blessing. That's why he says here in verse 7, he says, Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, now he's going to quote at length from Psalm 95. Interesting this now. He's going to quote at length from Psalm 95, but he doesn't say the psalmist says. No, no. He says, as the Holy Ghost said. And this is the great proof, another one of the great proofs of the inspiration of your Bible, of course. And Peter takes it up in his epistle in 2 Peter 1 and verse 21. He says, Knowing first that no pro prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of men. But listen, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit moved these men. And they are wrote down in this book. This book is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. It is Holy Spirit inspired. So, unbelief keeps saints from blessing. Indeed it did here. Because when these people came to Mount Sinai, you know, 
They had 11 days journey in front of them. 11 days would have taken them from Sinai into the land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey. Do you know how long it took them? 40 years. 11 days worked into 40 years. They didn't possess their possessions. Why? Because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. And the spies were sent in, of course, and ten of them were bad and two were good, and ten gave that evil report, and the people listened to them and tempted the Lord. And do you know, all of those who were over or over 20 years of age perished in the wilderness. Mind you, I was trying to work that out, and it's not easy to work out. One and a half million people died in 40 years in the desert and were buried. That works out roughly. In a rough estimate, I'm doing a rough sum. It works out about 100 per day. About a hundred people died every day in that wilderness and were buried. And why? Because of unbelief. They did, there was a land for them. A land flowing with milk and honey. God had prepared it for them. They only had to go in and possess their possessions. But because of unbelief, they didn't go in. You know, oftentimes believers are like that. Paul writes in a great verse in um, First Corinthians there and chapter 3 and he tells us there that God has prepared those things for believers but oftentimes you know believers are like these people here and through unbelief they don't possess their possessions possess the possessions that God has given for you but then as I finish this morning quickly because I see the time's gone not only does uh, Unbelief keeps saints from blessing, but it keeps sinners from salvation. Keeps sinners from salvation. Verse 8 here, he says, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. He says, these, pe these people provoke God. Then he says in verse 9, Your fathers tempted, they tempted him. Then he says in verse 10, They err in their ways. They have not known my ways. They went astray. Verse 18 and 19, through disobedience he was grieved with them and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. They sinned, they didn't enter into their rest. And maybe there's someone listening to me this morning. I'm going to apply this this morning, just a wee word in the gospel as I finish this morning. For you who are listening, who have never trusted Christ, and you're not in this household of faith. You're not, in the, you're not built in. You've never trusted Christ. You have a hard heart of unbelief. That's verse 12. Lest there be an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the, li the living God. You have a hard heart of unbelief. Your heart is hard through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 13. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You've never entered in. You'll never enter into heaven. Verse 19. So then they could not enter in because of unbelief. These are serious things this morning. Never enter into heaven except you're in this household of faith. How do you get in? You listen to the word of God. Look at verse 7. Wherefore as the Holy Spirit say, Today if you will hear his voice, hear the voice of the Holy Spirit this morning speaking to you. What does he say to you? The good words of invitation of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 11 verse 28. Come unto me all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Grace opens the way this morning. The way of the cross leads home. You must come. And put your trust in that one who is the apostle and high priest of our profession, even Christ Jesus. There's a great verse in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 10. Here's what it says. This is what you must do this morning if you're not saved. To as many as received him, to them give he power to become sons of God. Even to them that believe in his name, who were born not of blood, you weren't born into it, nor of the will of the flesh. There's no fleshly act can put you in it nor of the will of man. There is no preacher or pastor or priest or pope or potentate can do it. There's only one man can do it. As many as received him, to them give he power to become sons of God. It's putting out the empty hand of faith and putting it in that nail-pierced hand of the Saviour and trusting him and having your sins forgiven and you get into this great household of faith. Your trust and your faith in this one who is the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now time's gone. What a chapter. Tremendous chapter. Where we see the apostle and high priest of our profession. Third lovely title of the Lord Jesus.
And then this warning passage in the end of the chapter that reminds us that unbelief not only keeps the saint from blessing, but keeps the sinner from salvation. So that's where we study this morning. Maybe quite a wee bit to take in this morning, but I trust it'll be a help and a blessing to you. And next week, all being well, we'll go into chapter 4 and we're confronted with two more great Old Testament characters, Joshua and Aaron. And there's two, of course, that were faithful in chapter 2 well, in chapter 3 that I didn't get time to look at this morning. Maybe look at them next week as we enter in. That is Joshua and Caleb because they were men who were they were men who were faithful to God and God allowed them to come into the great land of promise, the land of blessing. So there you have it, chapter 3. Have a good day and have a good week and all being well. We'll see you next week in the will of the Lord. Bye for now.